वसुदेवसुत देव कंसचाणुरमर्दनम देवकी परमानंदम कृष्ण वंदे जगद्गु In the Bhagavad Gita, we are studying the second chapter, almost towards the end. Arjuna had asked a question about the enlightened person. The term used there is the one of stabilized wisdom. And we who have been associated, we have been studying Vedanta for some time. We know the importance of that term because ultimately the question comes down to it: is this that I? I begin to get what Vedanta philosophy is teaching me, but um, how can I make it steady, and how can I uh, implement it in my life? How can I live it? So that stabilized wisdom is a particularly very well chosen f- phrase. Arjun asks that question. Stita pragya, and in that discussion, we came across a term last time, prasada. Prasada, not in the term of the offered food, which is so beloved to devotees. The food is offered to the deity, and then we take it. But prasada here means pure mind, and a pure mind is usually associated with gladness, with happiness, with joyfulness. So prasanna, there is a word prasanna in uh, Sanskrit and in most Indian languages, which generally means a wholesome gladness. That's a good way of putting it. If you look into your own, those who have Indian languages, if you notice how prasanna is used, it's basically there's an element of wholesomeness there, and there's an element of gladness and happiness there. Now, this kind of mind is is required for manifesting or stabilizing wisdom. This kind of mind is required for stabilizing wisdom. Now, if you remember the verses we did. Um, Sixty-four, sixty-five, sixty-six. It was sixty-fourth verse. Was we have done this last time? Raga dvesha vyukta is to vishayan indriyesh charan. This is in reply to a question asked by Arjuna. How does this enlightened person interact with the world? How does this person talk and walk and, I mean, in the small things of life, how is this person any different from us? This enlightened person. Now, this raises an interesting question. Interaction with the world means the sense organs interacting with their objects. That's a philosophical way, a fancy way of saying that you see and hear and smell and taste and touch, and you walk and talk and eat and um, work and uh, live life, basically. Unless you are in deep samadhi or in deep sleep. You are you are continuously interacting with the world, so this interaction with the world, it's problematic because the preceding verses said, if you dwell too much on the objects of the senses, dhyato vishayan pungsa. Do you remember the earlier class, the eight steps to destruction? Thinking too much about worldly things, about the worldly objects, the the objects of the senses. An attachment goes sangas te shopa jayate. From attachment comes desire, raga. I want it, and if that desire is satisfied, then there is no end to it. Greed, lobha. But if it is somehow thwarted, then anger, kama krodho bi jayate. And from anger comes delusion. From delusion comes loss of memory. Loss of memory, not in the Mount Sinai sense, <laughs> in the sense of exactly what is being discussed. The knowledge which I am trying to gain and establish that is shaken up. That doesn't seem to be there anymore. So loss of that knowledge, and with loss of that knowledge, buddhi uh, buddhi nasha. The decision making faculty is lost, and then we do things which we later regret. We say things which we later regret. In any case, we are very much what we would label as unspiritual. Buddhi nasha pranashyati. That means one falls away from one's high spiritual goal. But the root of it was. Dwelling on sense objects, dhyato vishayan pungsa. What I'm trying to do here is look at the conflict between the two. Too much dwelling on sense objects leads to all sorts of nasty things happening, as far as your spiritual life is concerned. And yet, the very next next verse says, "Indriyesh vishayan charan." 
interacting with the sense objects with your sense organs. That means eating, drinking, walking, talking, working. So all of that, he says, doing all that, you attain prasad, a serenity, that, 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 that state of mind where wisdom can be stabilized. Let me sharpen this question. In spiritual life, are we supposed to dwell on sense objects or not? In day-to-day life, we have to. If you say no, then it's practically impossible. How many of us can afford to be yogis sitting in cells or in mountain caves? We are continuously have to be in the midst of life. Just like Arjuna in the battlefield. The battlefield of life is our battlefield. So that's where we are at. So that's where this, this concept of prasada is important. He says, don't misunderstand. I am not telling you not to live life. Then what do you do? He says, Raga dvesha viyukteistu. With a mind which is free from attraction and repulsion. With that kind of a mind, engage your senses in action. The eyes can see, the ears can hear, the tongue can taste. Uh, uh, you can work. Well, your hands can work with your legs, you can walk around. You can do everything that you are doing in life. The commentators say, Anishid, Anishid dhan vishayan. The, not, the, the ones which are not prohibited. Basically what your own, I mean a, a traditional scholar would say, what, what the scriptures do not prohibit. What is permitted, within that circle you can experience the world and you can, you can work in the world and do whatever. Enjoy things in the world too. Let's say in a very general sense, where your own conscience doesn't rebel. Within that limit, within that limit, with the proviso, with the condition that the mind has to be tranquil. The mind should not be full of, I want that, without that I will not be happy. I hate that, that object, that place, that person, that something about me. Uh, These things I don't like. No, not this kind of mind. With a mind devoid of a tranquil, then if you use the sense organs to actually interact with the sense objects, it seems just the opposite of what was warned just now. If you, if you deal too much with the sense objects, you're going to fall away from spiritual life. It says, no, the enlightened person or the spiritual seeker also, us, you can continue to live in the world and you must continue to do, with that, do that. There's no other option. There's no other practical option. But with the mind... Uh, with the mind which has transcended or risen above strong likes and dislikes. And how do you rise above strong likes and dislikes? Enlightened person, that's, that's far off. And I am the Atman, I don't need all of this, everything is Brahman. That's very good if you have that. But before that, I need to become enlightened. And the mindset of Siddhartha when he's going to become the Buddha. I shall sit on this in this meditation posture, let my flesh melt away from the bones. But I shall not rise from this without attaining, uh, without attaining bodhi, enlightenment. So in my life, my goal is enlightenment. When that is the goal, then everything else falls into place. How much, if my goal is enlightenment, how many movies do I need to see? <laughs> Which channels should I uh, subscribe for in TV? And so when I came here first, there's a big TV upstairs. I thought this ashram has a TV. Then somebody said, the only channel they have is the Vedanta talk. The, <laughs> the Swami's talk is shown on this TV, nothing else. So which, which, so once you've decided, this is my goal in life, everything else falls into place. Do I need to have a job? Yes. Do I need to lie and climb the corporate ladder? No. Because that's not my goal anymore. Everything falls into place. But must, one must seriously want that. And then bring the light of that highest goal to bear upon all the questions of life. A lot of decisions become pretty easy. Decisions become easy, granted that the mind is not, not muddied with strong likes and dislikes. Otherwise, I know what I should be doing, but I can't do it. That's because the mind has strong Raga Dvesha. So without Raga Dvesha, if the mind dwells on sense organs, uh, and the sense organs dwell on their objects, there's no problem. It will still be 
प्रसादम अधिगछति attains a wholesome purified state of mind and once that prasada is there sarva dukha naam hani rap asyo pajayate 65 verse number 65 in that state of mind well before enlightenment you go beyond a lot of suffering a lot of suffering you see most of suffering a good deal of suffering is psychological they say Psychologists call it in this country. This frame of mind. It says, "Ain't it so bad? <laughs> it's so bad. It's so awful." That state of mind that causes most suffering. Given certain set of circumstances, you might say, "But it is awful. It is awful that I've got this disease. It's awful that my finances are poor. It's awful that such and such people don't like me." Is that true? Because in exactly the same circumstances, aren't there people who are also happy? So, is it the circumstances which are to blame, or or my mind, the way I'm looking at it? So, in a with a mind like this, with prasada, the mind like this, when when the mind has prasada, then sarva dukha nam hani, all sufferings tend to fall away. In spite of problems in life, problems in life will not go away. Why are they there at all? We'll say karma, our our past karma. So it's a mixture of good and bad because of our past karma that continues. The Buddha, a remarkable passage, he said, "What is suffering? Dukkha." He's very big on dukkha. <laughs> the first four noble truths of the Buddha. If nothing else, we should remember these. There is suffering, dukkha. Number one, first noble truth. One great Swami of our order, Swami Tapasya Nanda Ji, um, who was the vice president of the order, he was in Chennai. He used to say, "Buddhism is a serious religion." He would speak like this. It seems, mm-hmm. Buddhism is a serious religion. You have to start with the idea that everything is suffering. Without that, Buddhism has not started for you. <laughs> so, dukkha, sarvam dukkham. Second, second noble truth. There is a cause of suffering. Supposing there were no cause, then there would be no remedy. Also, just there, it's a fact of life. Suffering is there. No, there is a cause, and the cause is raga, uh, trishna. This this trishna means it's not just desire. It is a it's a thirst. Tanha, trishna. In Pali, tisha. They'll say um, it's a thirst. In fact, the Sanskrit word trishna means thirst. In many Indian languages, Trishna means thirst. And then, is there a solution for this? Yes, because the moment you say there is a cause, if you remove the cause, effect will be removed. If Trishna is the cause of dukkhas, this this passion, this this hunger, this thirst is the cause of suffering. Then, if you remove the cause, suffering should also go away. Remove the um, the cause of the disease, the suffering of the disease should also go away. Yes, there is a solution. What is that? Nirvana, Nirvana. Third noble truth. Fourth one. How do we get that Nirvana? Is there a process, or is it just fortuitous? That means just comes, just get it, or you don't. No. There is a way. Adopt the way, you will get it. And do not adopt the way, you won't get it. So there is. It's called Ashtanga Marga, the noble eightfold way. So the whole of Buddhism follows from that. But the first one, Dukkha, is suffering. Buddha talks about the dukkha, and he says, "How does this suffering work?" He says, "It's like a man hit by two arrows. First arrow hit, it stings, it hurts, and immediately imagine the person is hit by a second arrow. Imagine the suffering. So our suffering is like that. The first arrow is what happens. A doctor tells you tells me that I have got a disease." Or my bank gives, or my stockbroker gives very bad news. That's what happens. Or somebody um, misbehaves with you. That's the happening in the world. That's the first arrow. The second arrow is the reaction within. It's in the mind. It's in the heart. Ain't it so bad? This is so horrible. This is awful. Poor me. So this is this is the second one, and the Buddha says, "I cannot do anything about the first arrow. 
He can do something, but that's much, much later. It's a long process. Ultimately, that also will stop. But right now, what my teaching can do is remove the second arrow. And most of our suffering is due to the second arrow. That suffering goes away when that prasada comes. This um, joyful, a causeless joy. A joy of the pure mind. There was a movie. I haven't seen the movie, but I like the title. A Hollywood movie many years ago. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. It's some other thing. It was something to do with amnesia or something like that. But anyway, but I like the title. Eternal sun, Sunshine. That's a very good way of putting prasada. Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And then, the second thing which will happen if, which will happen if prasada is there, Yashu buddhi pariyavatishthate. The whole point is, when will uh, enlightenment come and be stabilized? In this mind, enlightenment comes and is stabilized. That was the question. Stabilized wisdom, stable wisdom, permanent wisdom, permanent enlightenment, not coming and going. It will happen when this such a mind is there. And then there was this nice verse, Nasti buddhi ayuktasya nacha yuktasya bhavana nacha bhavayata shanti ashantasya kuthas sukham. Unless a person is constantly controlling one's senses, purifying the mind, nasty buddhi, and uh, that knowledge will not mature into enlightenment. It will, meditation is also impossible. If the mind is continuously disturbed by sen- sense impressions, meditation is impossible. Uh, na bhavana. Without meditation, peace of mind is not there. Mind will not settle down on what is called Atma Vastu, the, the self within, the reality within. Mind won't settle down. And if it, do, it does not settle down, Ashantasya Kuthas Sukham, where is happiness for the, for the one without peace? That's a good, good saying in itself. But here the deeper meaning is, unless the mind settles down steadily in the knowledge, I am Brahman, that Ananda, the, the bliss of liberation, will not manifest. Now, going on, He's giving an example. 67. Indriyanam hi charatam Indriyanam hi charatam Yanmano nu vidhiyate Yanmano nu vidhiyate Tadasya harati pragyam Tadasya harati pragyam Vayur navam ivam bhasi so whenever a particular sense organs of our five sense organs follows its object, eyes go to something they like to see, so on, the mind follows after it. The mind goes after it. And when the mind goes after it, the knowledge which is in the buddhi, intellect, the conviction, I will be enlightened, or I am that witness consciousness, and drishya vivek, or whatever, Many people say, 12 classes I've seen, Swami, all 12 classes, what happens? It gets shaken. (laughs) Buddhi gets shaken. Like, Tadasya Harati Pragyam, uh, that wisdom is stolen away as it were. Like, like a little boat. Imagine a little boat on on the wide river, on the Hudson here, or on this high seas. The wind blows it off course. What is the wind? The sense is going after their objects, the mind following, and then the boat is bl- blown around that way. The boatman wants to go this way, and the boat goes that way. In fact, one of the commentators says, if the boatman is not skilled, then the boat will be all over the place. It's going this way, that way. In fact, I, I read once that student pilots, when they first learned flying, Instructor tells them, you fly, don't let it fly you. <laughs> because don't let it get away from you. It, it's a powerful machine going this way and that way. <laughs> so they get desperate sometimes trying to bring it under control. So that's what happens. Uh, the boat is blown off course. How this works is, a spiritual seeker wants to realize God and is praying and meditating and studying and trying to live life the way he has thought he should live. And then something seems nice. That food is nice. See, senses, taste. 
Now that food is nice, very good. It gives me joy. See, mind is now going after the senses. Tongue tasted the food, but the now mind is now mind is following up, <laughs> following up on it. It's nice. Where can we get it? <laughs> ah, Broadway. That's that particular restaurant is there. And the Buddha says, "But just a minute. That's your meditation time. So one day exception we can make." <laughs> and so the Buddha follows along with it. Now, quite far away from the goal. The goal was, I want to be enlightened. What what importance does have does this one particular dish have for you? For what relationship does it have to enlightenment? Nothing. It goes away. It goes away in two ways. This Sadhu Ram Sukhdas Ji he pointed out. He said the wind can do two things to a boat on the high seas. One is, it can blow it off course, and in the worst case, it can sink the boat. What the senses do is, they attract you to certain things which may not be bad in themselves. So a nice dish you like, you go off and you, whatever it is, all the five senses, they take you away. From, and, and then you're, you're, that you're per- pursuing a spiritual goal, that gets disturbed. And not one day. If you do it, you do it once, the next time you'll be that much weaker. Next time, and then it becomes a habit. Then the, then the intellect also becomes part of the gang. It starts, starts making excuses. The intellect is supposed, buddhi is supposed to decide, right or wrong. And the buddhi first says, is this quite right? But you thought, you wanted to be an enlightened person. And by the end of the week, the buddhi is saying, ah, nothing much. And let, <laughs> let's, let's, let's do it. That's no problem at all. Join the gang. So that's one. It goes off course. Still nothing wrong in it, but just you're not going towards your goal. But then what happens is, if the senses go after something which is immoral, which is actually um, beyond the limits of decency and morality, it's like the boat being sunk. So the two things can happen to the boat. One, it goes off course, don't have to attain enlightenment, doesn't get to a goal. Or it sinks, worst case. <laughs> so there are things, addictions, um, uh, obsessions, things like that happen and then they're finished. Very far, very, very far away indeed from spiritual life. Smallest things. The masters know this. Little things. The monk under whom I joined, Swami Suhitaranji Maharaj, uh, he told me of his training when he was a novice many, many years ago in the 1950s, um, early 60s, under Swami Premeshanandaji, who was a disciple of the Holy Mother. This Swami Premeshananda was regarded as an enlightened soul, a Jivan Mukta, Stita Pragya, in our order. I never saw him, it was long before my time. So there's a little story, there are many stories, little story. One day in the evening, this was in Benares, in our ashram in Kashi in Benares. This is a big monastery. It's a hospital, many monks, busy. And in one room, this old Swami would stay, who was not well, Swami Premeshanji, and this young novice, who was my mentor, this young novice uh, would tend to him. His duty was to tend to the old, like nurse the old Swami. So in the evening, after evening prayers, some of the monks came and uh, said to this young novice, come to the kitchen, we'll have uh, tea and muri. Muri, you know, (laughs) Like puff rice. Before you go for meditation or whatever. It's just So this um, young this Swami told me that I went along. And then I came back. And Swami Premeshananda was lying on the bed. He's old and sick. He watched everything. Didn't say anything. Mm-hmm. Next day, after prayers, Swami Premeshananda himself asks this young monk, I mean Swami Suhitanandaji, what happened? Won't you go? Muri? And then Swami Suhitanji said, he said, I, I just said innocently to, to, to him, to the old Swami, no, I didn't like it. I mean, they, um, we, we eat that and we, we drink tea and then we gossip a little. I didn't like that in the evening after, before prayers. So I decided not to go. The old Swami was lying with his eyes closed. He said, you are saved. Basically, <laughs> he said, you are saved. What a big thing. Just a little puffed rice and a cup of tea and ten minutes of gossip. He says, no, you're saved. This is a minor thing. 
the wind blowing you off course. This is what is meant here. Now one of the commentators, Madhusudan Saraswati, says, makes a comment, we we'll just keep it in mind, we will see why, why he has said it, we'll see next. He says, um, a, the sense organs can blow the mind off course. It's like a wind blowing the boat off course. But only when the boat is on water. Note what the verse says. Vayu navam iva ambhasi. When the boat is in water, in the ocean. And then the vayu means the wind comes and blows the boat off course or sinks the boat. In the sea. The boat in the sea. Think about it. Did he really need to say in the sea? Or in the river? The, the idea is understood. Where else would a boat be? But the commentator picks up on it. He says, in the normal course the boat is in the sea. And it is so, he says, chanchalam, it is so unsteady. that A gust of wind can blow it off. The boat can be blown off course or sunk by a gust of wind. But suppose the boat is on? On shore. Uh, on the beach, it's on the shore. It's anchored, or it's on, the, on dry land. What can the wind do? Nothing. Nothing. What does he want to say? It'll be clear a little later. He says, you just keep it in mind. Because Krishna will come back to it in, uh, after one verse. There is a state, it means, in which um, the sense organs, activity of the sense organs makes no impression on, on the mind. There is a state. That's a state of enlightenment. Such a state is possible. He'll talk about it. One more additional point here. One sense organ is enough to distract the mind. The mind follows after that. What to speak of five sense organs. So the, it's just a warning. The five sense organs, the sensory system is so powerful. And then next. So what should we do? Give up? Oh, it's too difficult. 68 verse. Tasmadasya Mahabaho, Tasmadasya Mahabaho, Nigrihita ni Sarvasha, Nigrihita ni Sarvasha, Indriyan Indriyatibya, Indriyan Indriyatibya, Tasya Pragya Pratishtita, Tasya Pragya Pratishtita. Therefore, O mighty armed one, that means the warrior Arjuna, the one who has controlled all the sense organs from their sense objects, he keeps them under check, that person's wisdom is well established. If you want enlightenment and you want that enlightenment to be stable, then this is what, what that person does. The enlightened person or the person on the verge of enlightenment, the true sadhaka, controls all the sense organs. As does the enlightened person also. This difference, we will come, come to that. And the commentators, Sanskrit commentators say that, look at the words by which he addresses Arjuna. Mahabhav means of mighty arms, means a great warrior, who is capable of defeating his enemies, and so who is capable of controlling the sense organs. It's capable of overcoming external enemies, you're capable of controlling your own sense organs. Tasya Pragya Pratishthita. The place to be alert is the point of contact of the senses with their objects. This is important. Eyes with forms, ears with sound, tongue with taste, skin touch, nose fragrance, five senses, five, or, uh, five objects. This is at the most outermost level. Then the second level is what he mentioned. Even if the senses are interacting with their objects, if the mind has got prasada, if the mind is free of raga dvesha, then the senses can interact within the limit. There won't be a problem. So have you seen two levels have been mentioned? One is at the level of senses, control. One is the level of the mind, purity and wholesomeness. Relaxed. Luminous, prasada. But the real thing is coming now, next. Third level, this level of realization, aham brahmasmi, that level, that is important. Now, the commentator raises a question that such a 
person whose senses are as if a person is asleep, you know, no reaction at all to the external world. Whatever happens, you are walking and interacting with the world, but as if you are completely asleep, no reaction to the external world, not disturbed by anything, not tempted by anything. Number one, external control of the senses. What is the inner ring? The inner ring is control of the mind. Mind is a person whose mind is not at all, does not have ragadvesha, attraction and repulsion. And this is unrealistic. Who is there like this? Is it at all possible? The moment you interact with the world, there will be a touch of likes and dislikes. There will be some, some reaction in the mind. This will go on for everybody, even for the calmest person. Is it at all possible to be in the midst of life and be absolutely serene and controlled like this? Is it possible? Answer is yes. Yes. So now he comes to that. How is that possible? That this is at the level of, first is level of senses, control. Level of mind, purify. Level of the Atman, the real self. Yeah, to realize who or what I am. What will happen then? Now he's going to describe the Enlightened person. What happens to the enlightened person? How does this enlightened person control the se senses or purify the mind? 69. When we go into this, remember what he is trying to say here is, the enlightened person sees, and one of the commentators says, an entirely new land which we are not aware of. He is seeing something, not, not with these eyes knows something, feels the presence of something, recognizes something. All, all these are inadequate work, words, but they are all adequate to some extent. You recognize it, you feel it, undeniably. It shines, its presence is there, which the unenlightened person just ha ca does not. Does not. That makes all the difference. That's what's going to be said. Very important and beautiful verse, 69. Yanisha Sarva Bhutanam Yanisha Sarva Bhutanam Tasyam Jagarti Sangyami Tasyam Jagarti Sangyami Yasyam Jagrati Bhutani Yasyam Jagrati Bhutani Sanisha Pashyato Munehe Sanisha Pashyato Munehe Paradoxical. When Krishna is imparting really deep stuff, then he is paradoxical. One who sees action in no action and, uh, and no action in action, that one really sees the truth. And that one is the doer of all action. <laughs> what does that mean? I'll come to you. Let me translate this. Don't forget your question. That which is night for all beings, there the enlightened one is awake. There the enlightened one is awake. And where all beings are awake, that is night to the enlightened one. That is what he is trying to say. What is that? What the enlightened ones see like daylight and where we are as if in blinding darkness. And what seems real to us, where we are acting, the enlightened one sees that we are dreaming, we are sleepwalking. Question. Does this mean that the uh, self-realized soul, uh, or self-knowledge, to put it in a different way, obliterates all duties in the mind? Good question. Answer is no. Answer. Does it obliterate all vrittis in the mind? Answer is no. Vrittis in the mind means movements of the mind. No, it cannot be. See, when I taste a cup of tea, so tea vritti will be in my mind. Otherwise, I do not know that it is tea. Does the enlightened person not know? Of course the person knows. The person knows, recognizes you, talks to you, knows what is to be eaten and what is to be drunk. All of those things he knows. All differences in the world are evident to him. If all differences in the world are evident, if that person is behaving, Krishna... He is driving a chariot. If there is no vritti in his mind, he will crash. He <laughs> will total it. <laughs> what happened? Enlightenment. <laughs> no. The enlightened persons are more efficient than us. They are more active than us. Much more capable than us. In many cases, if they want to be. Or they can be completely withdrawn like a rock. Absolutely indifferent. 
what makes them like that who eliminates all vrittis in the mind yogi the patanjali yogi raja yoga yoga chitta vritti nirodha why that's a way to attain enlightenment but after enlightenment uh, the yogi may or may not um, have vrittis in the mind but additionally one qualifier i must add this from the enlightened person's perspective if you ask are there vrittis in your mind the answer will be yes and no yes because yes the way you understand it like your mind my mind also no because truly speaking the enlightened person sees inside and outside all is brahman there are no vrittis at all vrittis are nothing other than brahman for the enlightened person see this is the difference the yogi who is practicing attains samadhi by eliminating vrittis of the mind yoga chitta vritti nirodha whatever the mind thinks of no don't know whatever the mind thinks of stop by silencing the mind the yogi tries to attain samadhi that deep inner absorption where the truth is revealed whereas this enlightened pers- person in the path of vedanta yatra yatra mano yati tatra tatra samadhaya wherever the mind goes there itself is samadhi notice the word wherever the mind goes which means the mind is going taking with these seeing hearing smelling tasting t- um, touching thinking remembering even desiring why not yet in every case their mind recognizes brahman there and so it is samadhi that's the tragedy we try not to think calm down the mind shut it down what do you get dark blank <laughs> boring sleepy an enlightened mind person's mind may be furiously thinking what does he see the serene brahman inside and outside this is the problem <laughs> this is exactly what he's talking about that which is day to the enlightened is utter darkness to the ignorant that which in which the ignorant move about as if in daylight is darkness to the enlightened what does he mean ya nisha sarva bhutanam tasyam ya the word here that what is that that which is daylight to the enlightened dark, that is night to the unenlightened what is that wouldn't you like to know uh, the commentator madhusudana says um brahma ham asmiti gyanam the the realization that i am the absolute existence consciousness bliss realization born of shravana manana niridhyasana of course he is technically correct the commentators he will point out vedanta vakyartha janya gyanam when you say tattvamasi vakyartha means the vedantic sentence the teaching of the of the teacher that thou art the meaning of that sentence flashes in the enlightened person that means the student and the student becomes enlightened what what does the student feel not that thou art then he'll go back and forth to the teacher teacher says that thou art and the student says that thou art <laughs> no the teacher says that thou art and the student is supposed to realize i am brahman aham brahmasmi that knowledge which is born of vedanta where is it born in the mind which has prasad the wholesome calm luminous mind which mind has this prasad the wholesome calm luminous get me one of those minds where can i get such a mind amazon prime <laughs> no that comes only by managing the sensory system controlling the sensory system of course the whole point is one is engaged in spiritual practices that is there so that knowledge is absolutely clear to the enlightened person ya uh, nisha sarvabhutanam sarvabhuta means all being sentient being especially it means all other human beings who are ignorant of this for them it is darkness they do not see what brahman you are the same uh, same guy who you, who you were how uh, what is brahman what is that how come you are the absolute <laughs> what is the absolute that's it's like utter darkness where is this brahman it's like i've got my eyes covered like this and say the whole room is full of light where where i don't see it take away your hand what hand <laughs> darkness it's like you 
Even if you explain it to that person, that person doesn't understand. They were, put it this way, they, there's snake and the rope. Snake and the rope. So this person who saw the snake and uh, then another person, wise person comes and says, no, 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 it's not a snake, it's a rope. And uh, this is how it's a rope, look carefully and all of that. After t- telling all that, so do you see it's, a, it's not a snake, it's a rope? The first person says, yeah, I get it. But just be careful, don't go too close to it. <laughs> Why? You, you understood that it's a, it's a rope. Why are you careful now? This person says, look, you understand it's a rope. You understand it's not a snake. I understand it's not a snake. But does the snake understand that it's not a snake? <laughs> <laughs> or another classic example, which um, no, the teachers give. That the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Then we go, to, we say, yeah, the sun is rising in the east and sets in the west. But when we go to school, the teacher shows us the globe rotating in this way. And that's, that causes the sun to rise in the east and set in the west. It looks like that. Afterwards, what happens? It's a good example. Because a snake actually disappears when you see it as a rope. But the rising and setting of the sun, it still looks like that. So when you look in the sky, it's rising. And it's setting. So if a kid thinks says to the teacher, look, you know, the sun doesn't rise in the east and set in the west. I now know that it doesn't rise and set in the west. But the sun doesn't seem to know it. It's still rising. Look, it's silly. It's still rising. In the, it's supposed to stop. No, it will not stop. This knowledge of the enlightened person is like that. When we say, where is Brahman? It's exasperating to the enlightened person. <laughs> For them, they say, if only these people could see what I'm seeing. It's right here. I am the pure consciousness, witness consciousness. What witness consciousness? I understand the body. And yeah, I sort of get, I understand the mind. But after that, what? I'm not sure. For the enlightened person, it's absolutely clear. See, what is, what, what is clear to them is the difference between body, mind and witness consciousness. Drig antar drig drishya yor bhedam. In very beautiful Sanskrit. The difference between witness consciousness and body mind. Body mind on one side and witness consciousness on the other side. This is absolutely clear internally when they look inside. When they look into the object of the universe. Um, Bahir Brahma, Brahma Sargayor. The difference between Brahman and universe. Right here. What you are seeing is Brahman plus universe. When you are looking at the altar. You are seeing altar. Wood plus altar name, form and function. Here we are seeing, we are actually experiencing Brahman with universe name, form and activity. This difference is not clear to us because we have the vaguest idea, even after studying what exactly is meant. So this is darkness for all living beings. And how does this person come to this knowledge? Jagarti. The commentators are very beautiful. Agyana Nidraya Jagarti. Who awakes from the Sleep of ignorance. That beautiful uh, Houston Smith mentions is in his Religions of the World. Buddha, after attaining enlightenment, he is going to Sarnath to, when he very preached the first sermon. So the story goes, he is walking serenely towards Sarnath and a shepherd boy sees him and says, What are you? And Houston Smith remarks, that many people, we are all asked, who are you? But what are you? Very few people are asked in history. What are you? You saw this the awesome expression on the face of this strange, calm being, silently walking across the woods. What are you? Are you a god? No. What are you? Are you, a, you know, like an angel, Devadut? No. Are you a human being? No. No. Then what are you? I am the awakened. I am the Buddha. That is the precise definition or precise characteristic of an enlightened person. The awakened. Enlightened. Awakened. Recognized. Seen. Meaning thereby, the rest of us are somehow either sleeping or in, in half awake. The sleepwalking, as it were. We are in a sort of a dream. This life which we are right now. I'm not talking about the dream which you get when you attend too many Vedanta classes. This, where you are hopefully awake and listening 
to Vedanta. This one is a dream. So Jagarti, you awaken into enlightenment. And Yasyam Jagrati Bhutani Sanisha Pashyato Mune. And that to which all other beings are awake, this samsara, here I am, here are my relatives, husband, wife, father, mother, children, boss, community, friends, even maybe enemies, and my samsara to live as others have lived before me and others will live after me and I have got a work to be done, to-do lists, especially in this city, a city which never sleeps. So, so much to be done, I have no time for all your philosophy. Imagine, in a dream, suppose there is a person in a dream, you are in a dream and you don't realize it and somebody comes to you, hey, wait a minute, what, what, I have no time, don't you know it's Manhattan? Wait, you are in a dream, you have to awaken from this. Look, what you are saying is good, but not right now. I have got a lot of other important things to do. Your awakening can wait. Let me finish all this first. I have to rush through these. I'll come to your awakening later on. Who is wiser? All the things that you are rushing around feverishly to do, they are within the dream. First thing, nobody tells you not to do them. Enlightened persons also do so many things. Look at the history of uh, the uh, spiritual masters throughout history, you know, in different civilizations and religions. Did they not work? Did they not accomplish things? They did much more than most people have uh, do in lifetimes. And yet, so you can do all these things. But what Vedanta is telling you, first awaken. All this is still, it will be there. Then you will know what is worth doing, what is not worth doing. What is not worth getting upset about. What is not worth getting upset about? Nothing. <laughs> There's nothing worth getting upset about. Did you have a question, somebody? No. So, Yasyam Jagrati Bhutani. It's like the unenlightened are like people who are in a dream. Imagine what it feels like to be in a dream. It feels like you are awake. Yeah. So it's daytime for you. It feels like you are awake. You are going about the business of life. It's only from the awakened person's point, point of view that you are asleep and you are dreaming. What you are dreaming about is darkness to that person. Because it doesn't exist. Not that that person doesn't see. If people are running after money and ambition and, and suffering over meaningless things, from meaningless from that person's perspective. That person sees everything. The enlightened person sees everything. He's not a fool. Maybe childlike, not childish. There's a big difference. I have seen spiritually advanced, we're very senior. I don't know if they were fully enlightened or not, who knows. But I feel they were, a few. They were childlike. It's simple, but not foolish. Oh, they understood much more than most of us. They were, people would, <laughs> would come to them with this or that motive. They not only understand the motives of that person, what's going on in the minds of that person, it could be scary sometimes. They see straight through that person to the depths of that person's subconscious, what even that person is not even aware of. And not only that, and says they see through to the, to the past of that person and what's going to happen to that person in, in, uh, in the days ahead. It's, it, it's amazing. And after all of that, they're full of compassion for that person. They usually they'll tell, tell that person exactly what is spiritually good for them. Maybe materially good, may not be materially good. If you're... People, I know in, in India there's a tradition of going to a holy person if you want something. People, it's a deep belief throughout India, especially in the rural areas that um, if a holy, truly holy man blesses you, you'll get what you want. Could be the most worldly thing. Why would a holy man give, give such uh, blessings? Because if this child is so attracted to the toy and does not want to think of anything else, give the toy. Let the child play with it for some time. After it gets tired of the toy, it will throw the toy away and then look for something higher. So sometimes it's useful. So if a holy person grants you your worldly desires, don't be too happy. 
You have been ranked and found wanting. <laughs> I remember this monk I used to go to, whom I, I definitely think one of the few I can count the fingers of my hand, I think, are fully enlightened, whom I have seen. He was a wandering monk in the Himalayas. He told us a story about when he was a novice. His guru was especially strict, a traditional guru. Um, so it was, <laughs> he said, he told us many stories of his training. In old monasteries, they used to wear, the, the sandals they would wear were made of wood, clogs, wooden clogs. And clog is a good name for it. it the sound it makes is very, very much like the word clog. So when you walk along, I have seen monks using it. I never used it myself, but in our monastery also have seen monks. So this monk who told me the story, he said when he was a novice, he, was, he used to wear that. And he would come along in early in the morning to serve something to his guru. And the guru would say, why are you making so much sound? This is very unfair. If you're wearing that, you <laughs> how, how careful can you be? You can be careful, but not. There's a limit to it. Why are you making so much sound? And he said, what made the scolding so much more unfair and biting was, I had another brother, another young novice. Who was? This was 7 o'clock in the morning. Imagine, they're we're supposed to get up in, the, in our traditional monasteries, including ours, 3.40 a.m. you sleeping at 7 o'clock is unimaginable. So this, my brother, uh, the other monk, he's sleeping with a blanket on his head. <laughs> and the guru can see him. And to rub salt into my wounds, after scolding me, the guru gets up and goes to that sleeping monk and says to him, uh, My child, my child, would you like some tea? <laughs> Bed tea for the monk. <laughs> and so this monk who told me, he said that, the injustice of it brought, like, it almost brought tears to my <laughs> eyes. So I couldn't bear it anymore. I asked him that I do everything you tell me to do to the best of my ability. And you are not satisfied with anything that I'm doing. And then I look at this guy. <laughs> <laughs> and the answer was stunning. He said, uh, in Hindi, I'll tell you in English, you will attain enlightenment. That's why I tell you. For him, not in this life. That's why I'm affectionate. Tera hoga, isiliye bolta hu. It's possible that you'll attain enlightenment in this very life. Therefore, I push you hard. For him, no, not in this life. So he deserves affection and love. So, I mean, Nirvanananda, in our order, he was a. Uh, he, he was uh, blessed by Swami Brahmananda. That he will have Brahma Jnana in this very life. He, was, he served Swami Brahmananda, the disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. And before passing away, Swami Brahmananda blessed this young monk. You will have Brahma Jnana, enlightenment, realization, I am Brahman, in this very life. The d disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Brahmananda, Swami Shivananda and others, used to scold this monk very much. And, they, and one day he asked, and then they said to him, that you will attain enlightenment in this very life. That's why we scold you. I asked my mentor, whom I mentioned, Swami Suhitananda, why, do the, why did the senior monks scold your generation uh, so much? We read in the books, even for small things. He gave a slightly different answer. He said that for them, enlightenment was, it's like as if on the palm of their hands. And their Impatience was, why can't these boys see it? All their problems would be sorted out, solved at, a, at one stroke, if only they could. And why can't they? It is so much possible. And he said, in their company, you actually felt it was imminent, imminent, possible. But they pushed. So there is a story of Swami Shivananda and Swami Akhandananda, the young monk who has written this, his reminiscences. So Swami Akhandananda was a direct disciple of Sri Ramakrishna. That's... Uh, where is he? There. On the, on, the, on the side. So he comes to visit the main monastery in India. And Swami Shivananda, another disciple of Sri Ramakrishna, is um, the president. They are all enlightened. And the, Swami Akhandananda is an old Swami. So he gets a younger Swami as an attendant to take care of him. 
So this young Swami who's written the, the reminiscences, he says, So at night, I made a bed for myself on the floor below the... There was only one bed in the room on which the Swami would sleep. So I slept, I went, uh, sl- I lay down in that bed and went to sleep late in the night in the monastery. And I heard, I was woken up by a banging on a door. And I saw Swami Akhandananda, the visiting Swami, the old monk. He has gone to Swami Shivananda's room next door. And he's banging on it. Dada Otto, Dada Otto, <laughs> elder brother, wake up, wake up. Um, oh, not wake up, come, come, elder brother, come. Dada, Dada, Shono, Esho. And Swami Shivananda comes up and says, what's wrong? He says, look at this young monk. He's sleeping in the night. <laughs> Has he realized God? Has he become enlightened? He's sleeping in the night. As if it's the worst sin he could commit. (laughs) And he says to Swami Shivananda, Tell me brother, when we were young monks in the monastery at Baranagar, the first monastery, did we ever sleep sleep a single night? When we were with Sri Ramakrishna, did we ever sleep a single night? And so Swami Shivananda said, He'll do it at his own pace. He'll be alright, don't worry. (laughs) He'll He'll do it in time. And this young monk who wrote the reminiscence, he says, I was standing there red-faced, <laughs> deep in that night in, the, in that room. So, awakening. For, from their point of view, yasyam jagrati bhutani, that which all beings are awake to, samsara, sa nisha pashyato muni, the enlightened person sees the muni, the muni means the person who has realized that I am Brahman, sees this as in darkness. All the great goals of life is darkness. You have to be careful here. Note that Arjuna wanted to give up this fight and become a monk. Krishna told him to pursue this fight. So if it's darkness, why? The point is, not that there is anything as such wrong. It is Brahman alone which is everything. But not knowing Brahman, when we chase objects of the senses for fulfillment... I must get this thing, then I'll be fulfilled. I must achieve, get that job, this person, that vacation, this clo- uh, clothing range, um, this gadget, then I will be fulfilled. Never will be, guaranteed. This endless pursuit of fulfillment from a world which cannot give you fulfillment, this is darkness. This is samsara. Yes. Yes. Uh, but uh, the time, um, time at which he has to realize that is also will play significant role, right? Because the person's mind is also important. Absolutely, the person's mind, the one who's going to get enlightened, the student's mind is that's absolutely important. Except for a very rare cases, whereby God's grace, or if the master is an is an avatar, an incarnation of God, who can actually change and mold the person's mind. And shorten the process by a lifetime. That's the rarest case. In all other cases, the masters can help us. Only if we want it. And to that extent, we can, we can do. Even Sri Ramakrishna, I'll come to you. Even Sri Ramakrishna couldn't do it for everybody. He did it for Narendranath. He did it for a few chosen direct disciples. Only if they wanted it. We say, we want it. Do you? There's a story of Swami Brahmananda. He's talking about enlightenment. And the first president of the order, whom Sri Ramakrishna considered his spiritual son, a spiritual giant. And he says, it is not difficult to give enlightenment, but nobody wants it. And the, a young monk who was standing there said, Swami, that's not true. I want it. He said, are you serious? Do you really want it? Yes, I want it. Come tomorrow in the morning. I can give it to you. Then the next morning that young monk didn't turn up. And then the next few days he avoided Swami Brahman and they would go out of his way. And Swami Brahman said, I know, they don't want it. <laughs> At this moment, if it is offered to you, we all think, no, I, I'm ready. But uh, that's not so. Um, I know a friend of mine, a monk, one of my batch. Don't forget, uh, I, I know you have a question, so <laughs> hold on to the question. A friend of mine who is a monk. So Swami Ranganathananda Ji, who was the president of the order, at that time he was vice president of the order. Another of those I considered to be enlightened. 
So he was in his room in the main monastery in, in Belur Mat, next to the room where Swami Vivekananda used to stay earlier. So that room. And we had gone to make pranams, offer our salutations to this Swami, Ranganathanji. I was last in the line, others had already left. So I did pranams and I left. Oh, it was not, I was not there at that time. This friend of mine, he went in there. He told me later, many years later, after Ranganathanji had passed away. He was last in line. And he, went, he goes in there and he does pranams. And Swami was lying down on the bed. And nobody else is there in the room. And Swami Ranganathanji, you know, he's always talk Vedanta. So he started talking about Vedanta. And that how you are the Atman, not the body and mind. And then my friend, this monk, he said, I said to the Swami, I don't feel that. I mean, I have read it, I've heard it, you are telling me. But I don't, it doesn't feel like that, that I am something, I am this immortal spirit. It doesn't feel like that. Then Swami Ranganathanda looked up at him from the bed into his eyes and said, that may be so, but what I am, that you are. What is here is there too. The moment he said this, something happened in that room. With this monk, he said, my legs started trembling violently. And in some kind of terror, he rushed down, ran away from the room and ran down the stairs from that room. A terror seized him. Notice, Arjuna, in this chapter, in this, he'll come, he'll come in the 11th chapter. Arjuna says, I want to see. I have heard it all. I have understood it. I believe it. But I want to see you as, in your real form, as Brahman, as the vast. And Krishna says, all right. Because you are dear to me, I will give you that vision. And he gives him that vision. 11th chapter is full. Poetic description of what Arjuna, Arjuna had seen. Even someone like Oppenheimer, he, quoted, he quotes from that. I come, time, the destroyer of worlds, as if a thousand suns were to rise in the sky together. Right? We all know this famous. He quotes from the 11th chapter. But my point is, what happened to Arjuna after seeing that? Scared, he was terrified. He said, I don't want this. It's too much. This is, earth is shaking. Every hair on my body is standing on the end. And there were a number of people to whom Sri Ramakrishna actually gave it. They pestered him again and again and again. And he actually gave it. Ridhaya Ram. Madhur Babu. Ridhaya Ram, his attendant. Who was a very simple village uh, boy. And who loved his uncle. Sri Ramakrishna was his uncle. And took care of his uncle. But sort of thought his uncle was a simpleton, you know. And, but he liked the fact that his uncle could give spiritual realization to people. And so he said, what about me? I have been hanging around with you for... <laughs> and I don't get anything. And he kept on pestering. And Sri Ramakrishna said, all right, be awakened. And he touched him on, on the chest. And Ridharam, Ridharam burst out saying, oh my God, uncle, what is this? You and I, we are, not, we are not ordinary creatures. We are beings of light. Look, let us go from land to land. He says, from country to country and awaken humanity. And his uncle, Sri Ramakrishna said, hush, I get these visions, visions day and night. And I keep quiet. And you are getting this just once and you are making such a fuss. What will people think? And then he touched him and says, Jaro, be, be as you were again. <laughs> and he says, oh, uncle, what have you done? It's all gone. <laughs> all right. There's a question there. Swami Vivekanan, very enlightened. He was favorite of Ramakrishna Paramahans. He suffered a lot. He couldn't sleep in the night. Hmm. It's not that he was, uh, he could have sought refuse and meditation. He could have done it, but he suffered. Hmm. He wanted to sleep well. So I, I don't know how to, you know, reconcile this with the observation of Swami Akhandananji and the Mahapurushji hmm. that we ought to be meditating. No. Uh, what, was, what was that suffering about? And he looked so old. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. Now listen, this is uh, that, remember the two arrows. Buddha spoke about. The arrow that will hit your body, the arrow of suffering, which you can call it our past karma, you can call it fate, you can call it whatever you want to call it. But that's there for everybody, more or less. The real thing which spirituality can do for us is to remove the second arrow. If you ask Vivekananda, so you are suffering now, you have got diabetes and other ailments and um, so was it all in vain, your, all your meditation and your realization? Of course not. That's the one reality on which he is living. He tells again and again. From that perspective, there's no problem at all. 
Whereas a person who does not have that and, and has all those diseases is really suffering, has no place of safety, no refuge. Whereas the enlightened person, you see, what is darkness to all beings is day to the enlightened person. So Vivekananda sees something which other patients of those diseases are not seeing. What the other patients of those diseases are seeing are only suffering. And that's it. What Vivekananda sees is the suffering in the body. He recognizes it. And the pain is also there. At the same time he sees something which is not at all touched by disease or death or pain. Can you not, nowadays we have got movies and stuff like that, you know. Can you not see a tragic movie full of tragedy and sorrow and yet remain unaffected by it? Because you know it's a, it's a movie. That one central fact saves it from being evil. The worst of things is tolerable. Not only tolerable, it becomes art and joy and you, throw, you give it an applause and say uh, encore or you say you give it an, uh, give it an Oscar award. Only when it's a movie. One, only one central fact. What makes the Holocaust terribly evil and what makes that movie Schindler's List, what makes it art? Same events. Only thing is, this is art because it's not really happening there. You are safe from it. Therefore, you are safe from it and there is really, it is alright if that, that realization has to be there, not just read about it. So, uh, that is the answer. It is not that both are true. One is true, one is an appearance. It's not that you are real and the movie is also real. No. What is happening in the movie is a story. You are the reality. Yes, last question. But so Swami, Vivekananda's pain was not for his own well-being. It was more directed what he saw, what's happening with the religion, with the nation, with the people around him. That is true. See, the two, the, the two things. One is the physical pain was there. His own physical pain. When the body got those diseases. That was there. That's definitely his. That's what he was asking. So that thing becomes secondary to him. It's, it's nothing. Now you say, what about mental pain? Did Vivekananda not have mental pain? Yes. Then how can he be enlightened? But that mental pain was not for himself. That great suffering he felt by seeing... Um, the poverty, the hunger, the superstition. Those, he says, those who are veritably gods reduced to the level of next door, there is next door neighbor to brutes. Why should they suffer so much? Can't we make their life better? And so that's, you see how spirituality becomes translated into social action. They're not two different things. I am Brahman, peaceful, fine. And there we need to have certain uh, uh, soup kitchen and the two things we are doing. No. That soup kitchen is an expression of I am Brahman. It's an integrated philosophy of life. It follows from that. Very good. Yes. That is true. And remember, he, he went on carrying out his master's mission, Sri Ramakrishna's mission. Thank God. That's why we are here today. <laughs> but, but, and remember, it's not just Vivekananda alone. He opened the doors to all this, all the gurus and yogis and lamas and all the accumulated wisdom stored up and crystallized in the East to flood the world. He opened the door. He was the first. He made the channel to the, this, this side. So from, he says, just as the Buddha had a message to the East, I have a message to the West. And that was Vivekananda. And another interesting thing is, he never wanted to do it. Sri Ramakrishna asked him, what do you want? After he attained Nirvikalpa Samadhi, he says, I will remain in that state. Once in a while, I'll come down for a snack. <laughs> but I will remain in that state. Sri Ramakrishna scolded him. Scolded him for having Nirvikalpa Samadhi, which is the end of any teacher's teaching, I mean, in a yogic path. Um, it's a fire on you. I thought you would be a great banyan tree. If you remember, uh, imagine a banyan tree in the, in the villages outside India, hot summer day. A great banyan tree under which so many travelers will take refuge and, and seek shelter and find uh, peace and rest. Uh, here you are thinking only about your own uh, liberation. Fire on you. 
And another time he said, I w- that the mother, he said, the divine mother has a mission for you. Sri Ramakrishna told Vivekananda. Vivekananda said, I won't do it. Who can compel me? I'm an enlightened person. I, I know. I, I don't have to do it. And Sri Ramakrishna said, your very bones will make you do it. Vivekananda later would say, I retreated to the mountain fastness of Himalayan caves to sit down and meditate. And I was as if ejected from those caves. <laughs> driven out into the world outside. The world needs you. It is suffering. I've seen those caves. Kasar Devi in, uh, near Al- Almora. Uh, another one? Two, two places are there. Um, there are places associated with Shakti, the Divine Mother. No, this is... No, no. This is much earlier. Near Almora. <coughs> Shri Bhavan is not near Almora. So in, in, uh, near Almora, if you go to Almora Ashram, they will take you in a, in a vehicle. Even now they are inaccessible by road. You have to climb up a very steep... You feel like a mountain goat while trying to climb up there. And there Vivekananda was meditated for a few days. But he said, I was as if pushed out by a force. You can't stay here. So that's Vivekananda, because they are world changes. They're called Jagat Guru. They, they change the whole course of spiritual life of the world. So we, are, we get the benefit of it. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astur